Uh, we're going to call this meeting to order, and would everyone stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. So, my name's Rick Ingalls. I'm the chair. Uh, I'll let the other two, three board members introduce themselves so everyone's aware of who's here tonight. Ashton Cotton. Ernie Wood. Pat Bovair. So, we thought we had five members, uh, but unfortunately the uh, fifth one didn't come tonight. Um, it's okay because we only need, per our ordinance, uh, three to make a decision. And we have four. So we have a quorum tonight so we can proceed. So the next item on the agenda is approving the minutes. And before I ask for a motion, there's been one correction made to the minutes. And that is at the very bottom of page one, the motion was four zero, not three zero one. So the, those minutes have been corrected. They aren't here for us, but we'll, the minutes that I have the sign tonight, if we approve, once we approve the minutes, we'll have the correct information. So, given that I've told you that the, the minutes have been corrected, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of November 17th? What's the motion to approve? Do um, we have a motion? We have a second? Second. I, I have a question. <laughs> and that's it? That, so, is there any discussion? Okay. Uh, it's just, it says motion pass 301 on the um, above motion. Two. Yeah. Is that the same? No, but that's because Ashton oh, wasn't Ashton here, abstained. so he abstained from that the top okay. one. Okay, and so the the one the the number at the end is an abstention. Yes. Okay. Yes, that's yes. correct, Pat. Uh, I think we've clarified Pat's question. Uh, any further discussion on the minutes? We all set. I'm going to ask for a vote. All in favor? Okay. The motion passes 4-0, and we've approved the minutes from January from November 17th. The second item on the agenda tonight is appeal, variance requested by appellants to allow the continued habitation of maintenance persons on-site apartment uh, number 8 George Street, basement apartment 4A, in the urban residential R1 zone. Our first meeting for a Board of Appeals went somewhat okay, but it was a little rough being my first one. So I kind of come up with a synopsis or a way I'd like to start these minute, these appeals. And so I think you all got a copy of that. Uh, but basically I want to just read to everybody that's here what uh, the board, I see the board doing and, and then we'll follow through. Uh, the Board of Appeals is designed to allow residents and property owners the opportunity to appeal decisions by the town with respect to the town ordinance. The Board is not a fact-finding committee. Our job is to just listen to the appellant, provide us information, and then based on the information the appellant provides us, we can act rather that there's been an issue with an action by the code officer or not. So, I found that difficult because my first time sitting here, I thought I was supposed to run around and get all the information. And it, it, it's not our job to do that. Our job is to just to listen and then act on whatever is provided to us. Uh, that is the responsibility of the appellant. The board will hear the concerns and ask questions and determine if there's a valid reason for the appellant's request. And then after hearing the appellant's request, we'll act on that if we find that there is a need. So that, that in the synopsis is what I think we're going to do here tonight, I hope. Following that procedure, um, what I want to do tonight is I just want to quickly, so that we're all on the same page, review what the code officer provided us so that we know we're all on the same page. And did you? There it is right there. All right. So on December 6th, uh, we received a letter, all right? from the code officer and on September 16th the code officer received complaints and went to uh, George, 8 George Street and at that point in time 
um, did a house inspection, and um, then let's see. I just spoke with in the code officer spoke with Mr. Latart and advised that due to dimensional requirements, another unit could not be added to this property. So, because it's a 0.25 acre lot, there were already eight units. There was also an electrical issue with the apartment in the duplex. It was being fed from the duplex and the tenant is using another unit's electricity and not on its own for the last three and a half years. Ms. Latart stated that it needed to get a tenant out immediately, but the tenant was giving him a hard time about leaving. Mr. Tenant, Ms. Latart also said that he wished the town could help him evict the tenant. When questioned about the electricity, he stated that he would have it fixed and hired uh, fixed as he hired a local electrician to do the work. Mr. Latart stated the apartment was already existing and there was not, and that and that this was not the case. Mr. Latart's lawyer stated that the apartment was already existing. Uh, Gerald, Mr. Latart came in to talk about putting the apartment in about 2018 and early 2019, and he was a told, and told no then. On November 15th, Mr. Latart came before the code officer with a building permit. The permit was denied. So at that point in time, the permit was denied, and there was a notice of violation sent on the 20th and that the apartment needed to be evacuated immediately. Proved that the laundry room and the legal apartment electricity was being fed off a separate line. And if that wasn't done, then there would be fines per the ordinance. And if he wanted to appeal that decision, that he could appeal the decision. I believe, unless, and I'll look to the code officer if I pretty much encompassed exactly where we are right now with, with this board, at the board? Correct. Okay, so the, is the board clear on, on where we are right now? We've got a violation, been denied, the, the, um, and Ms. Latart has brought a variance to us. So, We've never done a variance before, so let's go to page 120 and we'll just go over the rules for a variance so that we're all under the same understanding. So on 120, we're at 10-4 variances. Variances may be permitted only under the following conditions. A, unless otherwise provided in this ordinance, variances are obtained only for height, minimum lot size, minimum lot width, structure size, setbacks, and open space requirements. So those are the, only the, those are the rules that we can act on here tonight. We, any questions on what those words state? Variances cannot under any circumstances be obtained for establishment of any uses others otherwise prohibited. And then there are the four requirements for getting a variance that if the appellant meets the one of the requirements, then we'll go through the four rules. So having said that, are we all set there? Are we clear to some extent on what, what our, rule, our obligation is? Clear. So I guess I'm going to ask the lawyer for Mr. Latart, oh, Mr. Latart, just to explain, I, I wasn't exactly clear, I probably can infer, but what you're asking, what are you asking this board to waive, or what's the variance requesting? Variance of lot size. So you, you want a, us to look at the minimum lot size that's, that's on here. Okay. So, does everyone fully understand that where we're headed with this variance tonight? Yes. So, having said that, I think we are all set to hear from the lawyer for Mr. Latart. 
Thank you. For the record, my name is Brian Barrington. I've been a member of the Maine Bar since 1986 or so, um, 3113. Uh, my office is in Summersworth, New Hampshire, across the way. Um, so to give you, after receiving the uh, notice of violation, Mr. Latart did not ignore your code officer. He um, did two things. One, he contacted our office, and we initiated an eviction. Um, just because something is illegal under zoning doesn't mean that the tenant can be summarily thrown out of his apartment. We have to go through what's called the FED, or forcible entry and detainer process, to do an eviction. And a notice to quit with a 30-day notice um, was provided. Um, nonetheless, we feel very badly for, for Mr. Immons and wanted to um, try to preserve um, his right to continue um, to live in this building. Um, it is not an appeal of the administrative decision. Um, it, it is, you know, it's a request for a variance uh, because you appeal for an administrative decision if you feel that a use is grandfathered. Um, in order to be a grandfathered use, and we would have to prove that this apartment was in fact occupied as an apartment prior to the date of initiating uh, the zoning ordinance, um, land use ordinance in Berwick. Um, we've determined that I put in my written material that he's been there five years. I just asked Dennis Emmons himself, who's present. Uh, he said he's actually been there for eight years. Um, but Berwick um, zoning and land use regulations are older than eight years, so it's not, we can't claim that it's, it's grandfathered. Um, and so that's why we're, we're asking for uh, a variance. Um, so on the attached, there's an attachment to the variance request, which presumably you guys have in front we of have. you. Um, the, it's certainly, you know, it's certainly not an easy case. Um, the purpose of the variance procedure and why we have a zoning board of adjustment is when the strict adherence to the town ordinance um, is creates an unnecessary undue hardship um, and hardship is is a broad criteria um, and we asking the board in this situation you know to look at the unique terms um, the things you'll hear over and over again in terms of hardship is that hardship can't be based upon a pure economic loss and that the hardship has to be related to characteristics which are inherent in the land and building. Um, so that's the, uh, the force we know. So first we point out that we really hope that the Zoning Board of Adjustment can act as this safety valve um, for the public good because certainly there is a severe housing shortage in the Seacoast region. And zoning discriminates against the poor. It just does. Here in Berwick, you have a downtown area that typically had mill workers in fairly high density. Um, the building has been there probably since the 1800s or at least 19, you know, probably late 1800s is when it was built. And it was built in order to allow people to live there. Now, it could very well be that back in 1889, um, there, was a, there was and there probably were people living in this particular um, room. Um, this is an efficiency unit. It has a, uh, a, ba a bathroom and then it has an open concept room um, that has his bed and a, and a kitchenette against the side. And it also acts as his, as his, has his work area. And it's, you know, it's, when you say that you have to have 10,000 square feet for each unit, obviously in a downtown area, that's impossible. Now, if this was to be built out in the country, that, that's another matter. But there already is, um, I, I, uh, let me just double check. Let's see. 
Right now in this building, you have how many units? Six, I thought. Oh, six. There's six units. Someone said eight, so I was surprised about that. There's six units, and that would require about an acre and a half, and obviously that's not available. Um, so the physical characteristic inherent with the land is that this is a apartment building that's been in existence for um, you know nearly, um, what is that, 100 and... 2000, you know, one, 120 years um, with people in and out over times, and, um, and you can't get additional land, it's all wedged in. Um, secondly, we're asking you to look at the unique use of this particular. He is the maintenance person, not only for this lot and the six units there, but my client has 11 apartment buildings throughout Berwick, and, and he is the local rapid response maintenance person, super person that, um, that goes around and manages those repairs, um, does the snow walk, clears the snow and ice, and maintains the buildings for the benefit of the, of the owners. So, you know, it's kind of like the dilemma you have in a, in a in a rich area with a lot of big houses, you need some cheap housing for the people who service the big housing to have a place to live. Um, and, and this is a very modest and small unit, uh, but it's home to him. And the area benefits from having um, someone who's local, doesn't have to drive in from abutting places. Um, so, the unit itself is also the workshop. Um, it's the workshop, it has the storage, it has the parts that he needs, um, and that's also how this particular unit is used and, 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 and that makes it a unique unit inherent to, the, to its use. Um, in terms of the electrical issues, um, you know, health safety is never something that you get a variance from. Um, Crichton Electric is um, working on the problem. Um, they're working with a code officer, pulling permits to um, do the electrical work necessary. I'm told that those permits are in the process of being applied to and they may not be applied to. And obviously, um, whatever this board does has no, doesn't excuse him from having to, to clear the electric issues because the electric is, is life safety. So the, 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 the competing equities, um, the return not just for this building but other buildings and for the benefit of the people, um, we're asking that um, Mr. Emmons not be thrown out and allowed to still be able to live there. Number B is unique circumstances of the property and the general conditions of the property. Um, I think we've already addressed that, you know, the factual issues. Um, there isn't a single building in the downtown area that has 10,000 square feet for apartment. Um, it was an arbitrary high number put in in order to reduce density for the future. Um, but smaller apartments with more density is what's necessary for people. C is probably the easiest one here because it's not going to alter the essential character of the locality because he's been there for eight years. It's not going to change the density, uh, the use of the building that's already been there experienced. And it's, as a single unit efficiency, it's a one person apartment. It certainly doesn't um, change. Mr. Eamons is not changing the character of the neighborhood. And then the hardship was not result to the applicant. Um, you know, the building was built well before <clears throat> Mr. Letarte, um The, um, he thought it was um, okay to have someone live there. Someone's been living there for eight years. Um, and, and now, due to this enforcement action, he's, he's got to either a victim or, or try to get a variance. Um, I don't know if Mr. Eamons wants to say anything in support of it or not. Uh, but 
I assume that I make my, we, all the public hearing, you want all the members of the public to say what they have, and then you go into deliberation, and then if you want to ask questions, you can call me back. That's the way we usually do it. That's true. A lot of times if there's a question while you're standing up here that a member would like while you're still at the podium, we certainly uh, can ask questions at that time as well. So I can, I can, at your pleasure. Uh, I guess I'm not going anywhere. The the biggest issue that that I have with this is is D, um, and it's not just that it's the applicant. It says that the prior owner. So basically, that goes back to for as long as it's owned the property, um, you can't have done something to cause the hardship. And I'll use my house as an example. Right now. I, we put on a game room on our house that my mother-in-law lived in when she could no longer live, you know, on her own. We didn't come to the town for a single, for another occupancy permit. It wasn't an apartment. It was just, we all lived in the same, it, same house. She just used that room because she couldn't live in her house alone. Um, if I was to advertise that as selling it with an apartment in it, I would expect that I'd have to go to the town and say that now it is an apartment and I'd have to meet all the requirements that would be enforced by the town. Uh, so you can own something and it can be a space that's a livable space, but that doesn't mean it's an apartment. This is an apartment. You're, you're stating it's an apartment. It had to have been created by somebody. So I guess the question I got is, where, it, you're, uh, you don't want it to be grandfathered, but at the same time, someone put this apartment in. Do you have any knowledge of that? I can shed a little light on it. Uh, Would you step up and speak, please? Absolutely. Uh, back some years ago when I, I came... Name and address. Well, Aaron Netto, uh, Berwick, Maine. Uh, when I first started working for Jerry Latar uh, about 10 years ago, I was in need of some help. He's got a lot of projects, and uh, so I brought in Dennis. He's a 26-year friend. Um, I brought him in to work with me. Uh, times were getting a little tough for him. He was spending a lot of uh, late nights working with us, snow removal. I mean, it just goes on. So uh, a little at a time, we kind of <laughs> chipped away at the work area and made it livable. Uh, because you know times were hard money tight right and a lot of late nights in Berwick so we took advantage of the space uh, more so than Jerry Latart and you know we refer to it as an apartment because everybody else has it was kind of just a space and you know rest your neck in it and you know time went on and, and we took advantage of it um, not because we wanted to because we had to and it made sense for the business itself um, for the fact that we're a very small crew. This is what we got. Right. And we're called out every single night just about. And we have to take turns being on shift. And nobody wants to get up in the middle of the night and run out here to these apartments just to reset a, a boiler. And so, you know, we're to blame a lot of it. We took advantage of a space. Um, and we're kind of, you know, now we're here trying to fix it all together. Right. Thank you. So he he gradually spent more, you and more step time. up to the podium just because we're on camera. Thank you. So my understanding is is that he, he, he people have been crashing in that room for a long time, and then instead of just crashing after doing some work, then he started staying there more overnight. Um, you know, is it? It's never has been an apartment for rent. It has been the maintenance room, and a as using a fancy word, as an accessory used to being an on-site maintenance room, he added a bed. As an accessory used to having a bed and doing maintenance in the building, he added a bathroom so he could use a toilet. Um, and it's not rented for profit, but it's for the convenience of the building. I mean, that's, that's the facts. Um, whether that
I mean, there wasn't an intent to rent this out as an apartment and create his own, his own hardship, but it was a necessity of business to have a place where someone could stay. And those are the facts, and that's the way it is. Is there anyone else out in the audience that wants the opportunity to speak? I think it's all been covered. Okay. Would the code officer like the opportunity to speak? Of course. Thank you. Very first came into the code office um, in 2018. It was like the winter. So it could have been early, early 2019, but I'm pretty sure it was that December in 2018. And um, he asked if he could create another apartment in his building. Um, at the time, the code of officer was Dan Vincent. Um, Dan told him no. So 8 George Street, just to give you guys a little history about our land use ordinance, um, it's right outside the village. It's actually one lot outside the village. Um, so anybody can come in and go in front of the planning board and the select board and ask for their lot to be inside the village when they're that close. Um, there's actually, um, believe it or not, there's another <coughs> lot on the other side of the road that is as asking to be inside the village to turn into a apartment building, which is a single family house now. 90% um, of the time those, those um, go to town vote and the town votes them in and says yes, of course. They're down there, they could have done it. I told Jerry this over, you know, in the office a couple weeks ago. But anyways, go back to 2018. He was told no, simply no, um, and it's true, he can't. Density doesn't, doesn't allow it, okay? Now, we in Berwick wouldn't allow an apartment to go into a basement or any kind of building to be rented for any kind of maintenance use unless it was a really, it was like a um, legal apartment. So it would have to be permitted. Um, there would have to be running, you know, there would have to be a stove in there. There would have to be, you know, a running toilet. There would have to be a sink. Um, doesn't have to have a bedroom. Doesn't have to have any. That could be a studio. Um, but it would have to be permitted, and it would have to be um, okayed by the code enforcement officer at that time. Um, I can tell you that if you fast forward, so he was told no by Dan Vincent. I'm just going to read some notes. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to 2021. Now we are here. Uh, we've received an anonymous call on September 6th. And that anonymous call, unfortunately, was it, it, it probably felt like, you know, to Jerry and his crew, like, you know, the town was dogging on him a little bit. If I was him, I would have felt that way. Um, there were nine violations that were brought to our attention. Um, the legal apartment was one of them. And then how that apartment is being fed, it's being illegally fed from the duplex out front. So the, where he said, I don't know where you got the eight units from, that lot has eight units on it. It has six in the apartment, and then it has two out front. They have a building permit right now to renovate one of the front apartments in the duplex. Um, I can tell you that Tim Creighton has not yet been hired to fix that. I talked to Tim on the phone this morning. Um, he was going to look into it, give Jerry a quote, and then go from there, but he has not yet been hired. Um, mm -hmm. He signed a check. Yes. So, I hey, today? I today? Yes. Okay, well, as of this was as of 10 o'clock this morning, so that hey. probably happened after. Um, maybe it did, I don't know. Right. I can only go on the facts that we have. Right. Um, Just one second. Yeah. So you certainly hold your comments and raise your hand, and certainly I'll let you come and address any concerns. Yep. All right, so um, another thing is you're calling it 4A, it's not, it does not actually have an apartment number. I want to make that clear. Um, letters were sent to Jerry. Um, he never disagreed with the illegal apartment. He's never once come to us and said there's nobody living there. He's been upfront and honest about it the entire time. Um, he, he was even upfront and honest when we called him out on the um, illegal electricity issues. He said, we'll get him fixed, no problem. He's never denied them. Um, he did come into the code office many times, and Tammy can witness that. Um, she's been in there when he's come in. Um, he's, he wants the town's help to get this tenant out. He doesn't want the tenant there. That's what he keeps telling us. Uh, members of his management um, wouldn't help him. They want to stay out of it. They don't want to get involved. That's just what he kept saying. Nobody will help me. My managers won't help me. No one will help me with this. 
Um, I told him we were unable to help him with this too. It was a no from us. Um, he said, um, my tenant can't move. There's nothing for him to move into out there. He needs this apartment, needs this apartment. That's typical, something we would hear. Um, the letter that came in from the lawyer said that at one time that this, could, this was possibly a rental unit. Um, so it said that this building was put up in 1900s. Um, it was a unit, whatever. I can, I can tell you as of 1998, and our land use was before that, it was not because I grew up in a, the apartment adjacent to that 4B. And I can tell you that we used to play downstairs in there. And the laundry room and that apartment were not in existing at that time. Um, and again, we moved out in 1998. So I know but prior to that, it was definitely nothing um, that was there. There was no bedroom there. There was no anything there. It's where Jerry used to store his stuff, you know. Um, other than that, um, I, as a code officer, I don't have the ability to um, grant them density for that apartment. I don't. Um, I have to follow our land use ordinance. Our land use ordinance says that there cannot be an additional apartment in that building unless they wanted to come in and um, provide information to the planning board, um, talk, talk about it there, and then go from there. They could um, go to town vote to see if that they could be part of the village overlay district, which would allow him to put more apartments in that building if he wanted to. Um, but I have, I can't help him any further. That's all I have I to there's say. There's a potential clear path to make it legitimate. There is. There's a few. Yep. <clears throat> I've got to ask a question. Um, if, because I'm not quite familiar with how this would all work. Sure. If this board was to uh, allow the make a variance to the minimum lot size. There's still no permit on this building. Would there have would the applicant have to come in and get a permit for this, even though we've waived, knowing that we waived the lot size? His permit's been denied for this building because of lot size. Mm -hmm. So if this board, his permit was denied after he filed for this appeal. Right, but I guess what I'm saying is I I'm just want to know if this was allowed. We, we, this board agreed that the minimum lot size for this apartment could be waived. Would there be a, re would he have to come back in and get a building permit for this apartment? Yes, and at that time we would turn it over to our town attorney to see if we would even issue one. Yes. Because you said that you, you saw nine violations, is that? It has nothing to do with the violations. Um, the only violations that are like in existence of this apartment that deals with this but uh, you know, particular case would be the illegal apartment um, and the um, illegal electricity feed into this okay. apartment where another tenant is paying for the electricity of that apartment. Certainly. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I certainly understand that that's an issue. So I yeah, those are the only two issues that would be Everything else didn't really have anything to do with this in particular. Right, okay, that's really, I'm just trying to, that's what we're here for, is to sure. get all the information, gather it all, so that we can you know, act on all the information we, we have available. Sure. You, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to correct it. Can you stand up, please? Yep. Yeah, I wanted to correct it. Nobody else is paying for the power but Mr. Latar. The power is being run off the other building, the project that we have a permit on that we're renovating. That's where the power is coming from. Thank you. Um, any other comments or questions from the public? Okay, at this point in time, we will close the public portion of this hearing and the board like the lawyer I'm sorry I, I forgot your name Farrington Brian Farrington Mr. Farrington it mentioned we'll discuss and if we have questions we will ask people to answer any questions that we might have before we act on any of the items here so having said that I will close the public comment portion and uh, I'm going to look to the board to was there anything that you were confused about or any questions that you wanted to bring up so between I, um, us first and then 
So you, you want to ask a question? Yes. All right. Go ahead. Oh, I'd like to know why Mr. Lothar does not want to go ahead and um, try to join into the village overlay district so he can make that legitimate. Excellent. And I'll, you, well, we're having immediate, we have a cease and desist order with $100 a day fine penalized. Um, so we don't have the lecture of waiting until town meeting in the spring before he has to vacate. So we're just trying to hold on to it. Bridge the gap. Yeah. So you uh, are. I do have a copy of the notice to terminate tenancy that I filed just to. Oh. Show that we, we did that as well. We haven't filed it with the court yet. What is it a notice for? The, the eviction I'll, I'll notice that I gave Mr. Emans. That answers your question. Terminate. This is a termination so of his pass it now. Anyone else have any questions? Ernie. Uh, Mr. Barrington. I'm reading your letter to us, um, and I've gone over it a number of times. And one of the, I have a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, just so you know, I'm a person that uh, I operate with in terms of making decisions based on fact rather than opinion. And everybody's got an opinion, but sometimes it's the facts that drive the results as opposed to opinion. Uh, in your second page, or, um, it says the apartments here uh, under A, under the variance, it says the apartments. I know there's some opinion above there about, you know, the history and so forth. It says, the apartments here and on adjacent lots cannot yield a reasonable return without this maintenance man being available. So in my opinion, that's, <laughs> or my read on that is that that's an opinion that it, it, it's, it's not based on, it, it's not based on, uh, I guess my point is that it, another another maintenance person could be hired. Another uh, firm that does maintenance could be somewhere off-site. So to say that uh, this maintenance man and this apartment or or lot here is is uh, so. It, it can only be that, or there's no uh, no no way of having a um, alternative. An, yeah, in, in a, <clears throat> income. Um, and so I was just curious as to uh, that that piece. The other thing I, I I have a concern about, and I don't know if the code enforcement officer has has jurisdiction on that, and that is uh, in in your. In your brief here, you have indicated that this space is also a tool room, a storage area, uh, a workshop, and some living space. Is that correct? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. So one of the things that I would have a concern about is what's in that space other than the living space with regard to chemicals, uh, gasoline, uh, I don't know. I'm just saying that if it's a storage, a tool room, and a workshop, and a living space, all in a space that is called 4A, from our point of view, how does that square in terms of its use? Uh, and it might have some bearing on whether or not uh, 
we can act. But we're not, we're not, we're not code enforcement officers, and we're not people who uh, have, you know, concerned about other people's health. But I have a question about that, so I don't know how that. that and it's in your brief, though, so I'm raising that question. So to answer your first point is Mr. Jerry Latart's position that um, he wants to have a person living in the midst of the property so they have immediate response. And for as you heard, when there's late night work, he can come in and out. Um, and it's not that he'll make no return on his investment if he had to hire other people, but we think it's reasonable return on investment would allow him to have a maintenance person on site for the benefit of all those people. In terms of what's stored in the unit, I mean, I can ask Dennis to say what he has there. I don't think he has. You tell us, do you have dangerous chemicals or gasoline? Yeah, please. Sure, they want to hear from you. Just say your name and address. My name is Dennis Emmons. Uh, my address is 8 George Street. And there are no chemicals whatsoever in my apartment. I just have my own hand tools, tool bags, stuff like that, just in case I need it right then and there. If I have to work on something right then and there, then I can. But there's no chemicals whatsoever. Do you, uh, you, you have some like hardware or marks or... My understanding is there's some parts there. Yeah, I have miscellaneous parts laying around. If we have to change doorknobs and right. smoke detectors and just all basic things we need for the apartment, just little minor things. Nothing with anything like that that can ever happen. Thank you. Thank you. What, uh, I'm going to ask the code officer, what would be required to get an extension into the village? What, what's the process of, for that? They just have to write a formal letter. They have to come in front of the planning board, um, share their want for that. Um, the planning board would tell them to go in front of the select board at that point. The select board could put it on the ballot for June. And because of where that building sits, 90%, if, as long as the town was okay with it, it, they would be in the village. So it, it's, and I think you said that too, Mr. Barrington. I just want to be clear. So it, basically, it, it, there's a process and it would play out till the next vote for the yeah. change in the ordinance. Because yeah. the ordinance, and that makes sense, the ordinance has to be changed to allow that to happen. I can't allow it. I, I understand. The ordinance mm -hmm. has to say it. Um, I just want to make that clear. It's not something that right. can just it's not say, a personal oh, sure, opinion. just do it and go ahead. It's right. not. It's a. It's fact. It's our land use. It's our law. It's our town right. laws. You mm -hmm. know. I also want to say that. Um, what was I just going to say? I don't know. I don't know. It will come to me. It will come back. Yeah. Oh, I also want to put on record too that say you know Mr. Barrington has come before you. Um, and told you that Jerry would love a maintenance man on site. Can, right. I, can I keep going? No, I, I don't think you okay. can because you're not answering a question okay. and then we'd be opening up public Sorry. comment again. No, that's okay. all right. Uh, I, I wouldn't be comfortable with that. No worries. Um, so we've, uh, do we have any, uh, Pat, how are you doing over there? Do you have I'm any? feeling very uncomfortable about all of this. Well, <laughs> a, a, what do we need to help you clarify any of this? I mean, I am all in sympathy for Mr. Emmons. <laughs> um, and um, if he's such a valuable person to Mr. Latart, I would think Mr. Latart would make sure that he had a legal apartment already and that if he realized that this was going to be an issue that he would have already tried to put in his information about becoming part of the village overlay. That option has been available for a long time now. I don't know how long that you can, you know, ever since the village overlay was put in. Um, and um, to me, it sounds like just um, an avoidance um, and trying to not have to do anything unless you're forced to do it. I think this basement apartment sounds, um, you know, it, it, it's not appropriate. It shouldn't be there. That's my opinion. Um, 
And I do feel that if we allow this, that there are going to be many other little basement maintenance facilities that <clears throat> would like to become apartments also. I do, so I do feel that it will have an impact on the neighborhood. I do not see any reason why this board should be allowing something that's already non-conforming to R1, which is what you're in and which you have not made any arrangements to change. Um, we, the, you're, you're asking us for, to make something even more non-conforming than it is. And that isn't what the zoning ordinance is supposed to do. Anything that's already non-conforming, the only changes are supposed to be for something to make it less non-conforming, not more non-conforming. <clears throat> so I feel like that's not appropriate. Um, I also feel like the lawyer is giving us, you know, the emotional piece about all this, which we, we'll, of course, all agree with. <laughs> um, but then Mr. Latart coming into the code enforcement officer previously says, I, I want to get this guy out of here. You know, he, I, I, I want to get him out. I don't have any way to get him out. You know, I need the town to help me get him out. It's like, Something isn't jiving. Um, and we really have the, the dimensional requirement in R1 right now. And adding another apartment to this, which has already been denied to Mr. Latart. He's already tried to do this before. And now he's trying again. Um, you know, it's like, what are we doing? <laughs> Trying to, you know, uh, to me, the whole thing just doesn't make any sense. Uh, I think that the, the variance for the lot size, which is what the lawyer is asking, I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to give because we're making something even worse than it is already. So those are my it, well, general feelings. <laughs> it, it, and I think what basically there is a process that's more than likely going to allow that to happen. What it's to happen? The that to get redistricted into the <clears throat> village and, yeah. and that's not being pursued. So I mean right. it can be. So it's not right. like it's not an option to do if if they if that was so chosen to be done. I know it's inconvenient because and it's expensive, but you know what? It, Everyone else in town who has an apartment and who lives next to the village overlay, that's been the talk of the town. Do I want to be part of the village overlay? Do I not want to be part of the village overlay? What do I have to do? So the fact that you're being, that now we're, it's being brought up and um, it's being forced, um, you know, like pay your dues. Yeah, the options you know? are there. Uh, you know, uh, plenty of other people in town are waiting or deciding and that kind of thing the same issue and if we keep if we want to give him some kind of an extension so he doesn't have to pay pay the fines or whatever is that what was that's what they're looking for yeah understanding. it's like oh well you know you should have anticipated this and done this everyone else in town is concerned about the same thing and if we give that to you we're giving that to every other person who yeah, you know, I don't. No, I don't. Think so. I, I right. will <laughs> ask the code officer a question. Now that you've brought that up, Pat, I, I don't know exactly. Right now, there's an eviction process going. Is that true? Well, you, no. We we just saw it. There's an eviction process going, so they're in the process of trying to get the tenant out. Um, if it was just a matter of once the tenants out they're going to have to come in and get a permit and like you said you might have to if 
I'm talking about if, if this was waived, if, if all of a sudden this, we agree that this is allowed to happen. Um, the tenants out, the, still going to have to come in for a permit, I hope, because that's what everybody else has to do in, in the process. I mean, just because we waived the minimum lot side doesn't mean that the, the apartment exists. It still would have to come in and get a permit and go through the permitting process. Um, the only thing I can see what Pat brought up is that the um, the fine is in, being incurred every day while this is happening. Is that true? It is true. We have no court date pending right now, um, and we have we have nothing on the docket to bring Jerry to court as of now for this. So, and that's that's who the judge would. Oh, the judge would reset, and so right now there isn't a font. Would, was it retroactive or from the date of the first letter on September twentieth? Right. So from that point on, if the judge found that there was a violation, then there would be a fee assessed based all the way back to. That's correct, and the fee is a hundred to five thousand dollars a day. A day. Every day the violation is in existence. Okay. Well, I guess in two thousand eighteen, when um, the apartment was denied, that maybe. Over that period of three years, Mr. Emmons could have gotten himself a, a real apartment in one of Mr. Latart's apartments if he's such a valuable person. So you, and he and his. You're talking to me, right? Yes, and <laughs> and that and that you know if he's so valuable to me, Mr. Latart would have made a spot for him, right. so that he could keep going, and they could have worked out some kind of a deal. Right. But instead, it was just shovel it under the, you know, it, just throw, put him in there and not, and know that he wasn't supposed to be there. And, and given the benefit of the doubt, because things can happen, mm -hmm. that at some point in time, there was a realization that they needed a permit and it was denied. And that's where, that's what got us to here. I mean, if they'd gone back for the permit back five years ago or six years ago when this started and it evolved into what it has now, it would hopefully have gotten corrected way back then. I mean, we all need permits in this town to do things. I mean, that's the nature of the beast. That's what the ordinance is for. It, it, when you go do work on your house or you have different, mm -hmm. you have changes in circumstances, you need to get a permit. Right. To, to and go it, do and it's always nice to try to avoid those. And, right. you know, when you're a business person and when you're a person who's already been told something isn't illegal, it's like... Right. And, I mean, and ha having said that, so that, I mean, I, I do think this is worthwhile and I like having the conversation. My biggest concern, the other ones I think we could work around, D is my biggest concern. Mm -hmm. uh, the hardship is not the result of the action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Well, yes, it clearly yes. is the result of someone doing that. So I'm not sure how I find that we can grant this variance when the ordinance says right here that if it's an action taken by the owner, then we can't grant that variance. That's, that's where, that's my hardship on this whole thing. Uh, am I missing something there? Black and white. I don't think so. Ernie. Uh, to the code enforcement officer, if I may, is this space, you, I assume as code enforcement officer, it's not just about land and size and so forth. It may be health issues, it might be, you know, hazardous, whatever. Is that under your jurisdiction or not? The health officer is our town manager in town. I can tell you that I personally have never been into the apartment. I, I can't answer. I don't know. I'm just wondering if, when you denied or when when you <coughs> denied the re initial request, where you you didn't have any, uh, did you have concerns about health or in other words could be inhabited that space? I'm concerned about it's because the space is going to be what I hear from the the appellant is that. They want to create a space that's an apartment, but it really is a 
living there's there's somebody living in a, in part of it and it, there's a tool tool operation and a workshop and storage is also part of this yeah. so does does any of that apply in your to your concern or denial of of this originally a couple of things here so i actually really enjoy working with jerry and i really enjoy working with aaron as well i find them very easy to work with um if i ever have any questions they're they're great i don't know i've never had an issue with either one of them um but i will tell you that if this was in the village overlay jerry would have been granted a permit for this apartment to add to the building at that time he would have gone through framing inspections insulation inspections um, we would have given him final occupancy for it, and there would have been some things that were questioned. If he had a workshop down there, it would depend on what materials were in that workshop. If there was chemicals there, uh, we, code office, and the fire department would request, um, you know, the data sheets on what the chemicals are in there, and then we could go from there. But without seeing it and being in there and not sure what the materials are, I can't answer that question. What do you think, Ashton? Are there any, any questions or anything? I think uh, Mrs. Latart should have uh, pursued the village overlay some time ago and made it into a good place for uh, Mr. Emmons to live. And he still so can. It. No, it's still there. Just you're going to be you know, accruing some uh, fines until you can get that done. <clears throat> Ernie? Yes. Uh, I think what Pat is saying is, that to me, sometimes common sense um, has has a real place in this, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, some things that should have been done weren't done. And if we're, if there if the appellant is serious about having a maintenance man on site. And available 24/7, uh, then common sense tells me that they, the the uh, person who owns the property, would make that happen without having to uh, go through all, all of this. And uh, that's to me just common sense. And I realize there's a lot of you know, uh, ins and outs of this issue, but uh, we're probably, in my opinion, not ready to make a decision unless we have a lot more information and uh, and also uh, uh, develop the, the, what the legal status is of this case. What information do you think you would need? I guess. Well, I'm I'm con I'm concerned that. If let's say I don't know it, it, the the process, but you said that you could, could appeal to the town to get uh, a change in the in the land use ordinance, so that if they're in the village. What does that mean in terms of having an apartment, so-called apartment, that has living space, storage, tool room, and and workspace? Um, there's a lot of uses there. And are you know, all of those uses permitted? I don't know about that. I don't know how that works. If if somebody is operating, uh, wants to operate a, a tool shop somewhere else in town, and then they want to add a little piece of room for a bed and a uh, hot stove and whatever, toilet, or uh, is, is that how that works? I don't, I just well, don't. Well, that's the permitting process. And right. that's, I think, what we asked, you know, if we were to agree that all four of these variance parts were met for the minimum lot size wouldn't change the fact that the permit is still there's still going to have to be a permit issued to allow this all we're doing is saying now it would be like what um, was, was mentioned is if the, it was approved right now by the town to put this into the village overlay then the he could come to the town for a permit. The permit would have to go through all the necessary requirements to, for the permit. So that wouldn't be our call. I mean, that's going to be back to the town's call, whether the, 
the building is an adequate space to be apartment. We're just saying the minimum lot size is okay. We're going to waive essentially the minimum lot size for this and then go back to the code officer to reissue a permit if they meet all the requirements for a permit. We're just saying it's allowed, the lot size would allow its use in that building. You following what I'm saying? In the village overlay. Yes, because if it was in the village overlay, which we're fairly confident that if the process was met, that would be accepted into the village overlay, then they, Jerry could come to the town and get a permit because the minimum lot size wouldn't be there anymore. So, again, the, one of the things that when I sit on boards, and I've sit on a, been on a few of them, is and this probably goes against everyone that's going to come to this board in a sense, but I hate to set precedent. We have rules in here, and the minute you make an exception, it's kind of like what's brought up. You just, it never seems to end. Someone else, I mean, that's why we have the ordinance. But I'm not making that decision based on that. We're going to look at these rules and make sure that the rules are met. And I'm still going to get back to D, really, until, unless someone in this board can convince me that how D is met, I don't know how we act on this. I mean, clearly, this was caused by the owner or a prior owner. This didn't become, the lawyer, Mr. Barrington, said that they're not pursuing the grandfather issue. So we're not talking about before 1985. So it wasn't an ex essentially it wasn't in existence before 1985. That means it was made an apartment by somebody, not us sitting here at this board. And I don't see that we have the authority to grant that because it was made by the owner. Self-inflicted. Self-inflicted. <clears throat> and it's not personal. I just I'm not having a hard I'm having a hard time getting over that rule. So, yes. So, so, may I speak? Yes. Uh, so, that D, really, when it says here, it says the maintenance unit has always been used for that purpose. Um, and I guess the, the issue that I see is that this is, in some ways, opinion but not fact and the facts are that whatever has happened in that unit is the result of the owners taking part in that making that changes not something else exactly. and therefore right. uh, I, your point is well taken Janetto yep. told us that it, 10 years ago or so it started to make right. it so it, you know, you know, it came about then. So, have we discussed this to the point where we've we're comfortable with what we think we're going to be able to vote? How you're going to vote on the following items? If not, we need. That's what we're here for: is to get whatever information we feel like. And before I w think about that for a second, I do want to ask one question. I'm pretty sure I understand, but um, these items, all four, if, you, if they don't meet one of those, that's it, right? You, it's not like you have to meet all four or anything like that. If, if this board decides that they don't meet one of the four criteria, and that would be a majority vote of this board, right? So, yes, and I, I will say... Uh, I guess, well, I'm going to ask for clarification as well, because we have a board of four. So what happens if we have a 2-2 vote on an issue? What does that do? However the chair votes is what passes it, is my understanding from legal counsel. It, it would not? It would. It would. So hopefully... We don't get to that point, but if we do, we'll have to um, 
if, if we go down and um, look at each one of these questions, or can we talk about them? Absolutely. Individually? Absolutely. Okay. I, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm just trying to get a gather the, get all the gist of everything. Mm -hmm. And to be quite honest, I don't know how legal it is, but I, I would like to start at D. This is what they're talking about. Just so you have it. I don't. And if we start at D, then I think all of them have to be voted on. We have to vote all of them. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks, Pat. Okay. So. I mean, you're welcome to vote, but we can also just withdraw the appeal. I mean, it's, it's clear how you're going to vote. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. If we want to be able to send you home sooner, we can state for the record that we'll withdraw the appeal and go forward with the eviction. I mean, you've already said what you're going to do, so. If you're comfortable with that, I mean. Mr. Latard says he'll withdraw the petition. I mean, we, we wanted to just do what we could do. Microphone. Needs to come up. Yeah, they can. Mr. Latart withdraws the petition. Um, we we did want to see what we could do. It's clear. Um, we withdraw the petition. Duly noted. And we, when we thank you for your input, I mean, obviously a lot of facts came out today, which is very interesting that I wasn't aware of. Thank you. <clears throat> do we need to follow through with this procedure? I, I don't know. Oh, I've, the end of I've said it for the record. I can. I'll send you a letter too. That would be the best way to do it is to also send the letter. But because it's on the record now that he has withdrawn his application, you don't need to make any decisions at all. No decisions because that case no longer exists any longer. He withdrew the application. The appeal okay. application for the variance has been withdrawn. Yeah, understand that. Okay. Yeah. I just want to put on record, Brian, that if you have any questions about adding that to the village overlay, please call me or come in and we can okay. meet and I can help you with that process. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with the appeal being withdrawn, that I believe ends that item on the agenda. Oh. And that, I flip this over. Thank you. That gets us to, there is, I do want to, while we're here in the meeting. Um, Are we still on? Yep, we're yes. still on, real quick. Okay. Um, we do have two items that are still outstanding, and that was the policy, the board policy paperwork, and the, uh, work for, we wanted to modify the uh, applicant's fact sheet. We still have those two outstanding. I thought we decided how we wanted to um, we change did, it. We did, but then it never came back. We, we sent oh. that for corrections and it never came back oh, okay. to formally be accepted okay. by this board. So okay. would you be interested in meeting the second Tuesday, the second Tuesday in January. Second Wednesday. Second Wednesday. Geez, I get it mixed up. All right. <laughs> second Wednesday to have those two addressed and we can approve the minutes at the same time for this meeting. Would that be okay with everybody? It's, I know it's over the holiday season and winter time and everything, but I just thought that way we can get that all clear, done and then we don't have, uh, then we can maybe skip a meeting and then maybe in March or something we can have another a workshop on another issue that we might want to discuss. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I'll, I think that's noted in the minutes that yeah. uh, we're going to have a meeting in, Jan in January, the second Wednesday. To, the calendar? To, uh, I think fifth, 12th. Yeah, I think it's the 12th because I think I have a negotiating meeting for the union on the 5th, and I'm sure that's a Wednesday, or at least I think it was. Like January 12th? Is that, if it, that's Wednesday, do you check yes. in? Yes, okay. yeah, that'll okay. be the second Wednesday, January 12th. Yep. January 12th. lawyer, I think, or from you. I it have it, it's lawyer's paperwork. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, 22. That was the only other thing I had. That's I just wanted to bring that up before we close the meeting. Yes? Rick, would you be able to meet with me before the meeting so I can make sure I get the two Absolutely, days? absolutely, for sure. At the stage where you remember them being there. <laughs> that would be helpful. One came back, but yeah. I'm still not. 
that's fine. No, I think it's important that we do. I, I certainly will sit down. I have off between Christmas and January. Are you, you working any of those days? Yep, we're only open Monday and Tuesday of next week and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the week of the new year. All right, so that will work out fine because, like I say, I, I yep. do have that week off, so that makes it convenient for me to stop in. So I'll, I'll yep. send you an email and check in to make sure you're there, and then I'll stop in. Yep. Okay, great. Good. All right, so that was, yes, it would be at 630. So I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Got a motion by Ernie. A second? Um, yeah. I, I Pat's, just, a, Pat's I, a second. No, no, no. I just wanted to, where, where are they now? They, they're That's going to be what looking I, at paying a fine once they go to court, right? Yeah, so um, basically he'll have to, they'll have to file that letter with the court um, um, to get him evicted. They will have to, we will be bringing them to court over it anyways. Um, unless he tears everything out and we can see that. Sorry. Should what? we stop talking? Okay. They're not here. You can't discuss the case. Oh, oh okay. okay. They are not okay. here. Okay. All right. Great. All right. I just didn't know how. Where we are, we are at adjournment. That's where we are now. <laughs> there we go. Yes, I vote. All in favor. <laughs> Ernie, are you in favor? Or are you abstaining? All right.